Hello everyone and welcome to episode 353 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. I'm Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and we have the full crew here this week kicking things off with the owner of MTG Goldfish, Richard. How are you this fine November morning, Richard? Hey Seth, so many previews, <laughs> so many oh previews. My God. Crimson Vow is upon us finally. Ooh, <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, we're, we're in the, the new uh, age of previews where they kind of do the whole set in like just over a week, and that means we got a ton of cards to talk about today. But before we get into that, we got another co-host in Crim. Crim, how did uh, how did the move go? Are you are you in your new place this week? I am in my new place, so I've got some new acoustics. I've I'm experiencing the downtown LA life, so I'm constantly waking up to car horns and sirens. So you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> everybody. I, I'm gonna be honest with you. I I didn't get it until I got here, but everybody is very uh. Let's go with generous with their horn. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get used to it. You'll get used to it. <laughs> it's it's just ASMR now. <laughs> oh, good. The sound of horns. City life. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, I, I I am the super opposite. I probably hear like one horn a, a month where I live. So <laughs> different, different, different worlds we live in. Uh, but anyway, yeah. today today we're talking in Estrad Crimson Vow. We have a ton of spoilers. We got new mechanics. We got new planeswalkers. We got a bunch of stuff to talk about, and I think we're just gonna essentially dedicate the entire cast to talking new Inside Crimson Vow spoilers. We'll see. Maybe slip in a fish mail at the end if we get a chance. But spoiler day for sure. Before we get into all the new cards, a reminder that our show today is brought to you by Card Conduit. And Card Conduit, you've probably heard about them from us before. They are a great way to sell your magic collection, and they're offering a new service geared towards selling smaller batches of valuable cards with reduced service fees. With their curated shipment service, you can sell your cards for the best available buy list price with only a 5% service fee. And like all Card Conduit services, you don't gotta sort your cards, you don't gotta grade them. You get to skip all those hassles and just safely package up your cards and ship them out and you'll even get a detailed report with the results so you can check out card conduits curated shipment option as a way to buy list up to 150 cards with fast processing optimized prices and the low low service fee of just five percent and you can even get another 10 percent discount by going to cardconduit.com slash goldfish card conduit they're the easiest way to sell your magic cards so thank you to card conduit for supporting the show and let's talk some innistrad crimson vow richard i'm gonna bump it over to you Guide us through some sweet, sweet spoilers. <laughs> All right. I uh, keep saying Crimson Val, and I keep thinking you're saying my name. <laughs> Mr. 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 Crim Val. Uh, all, of, uh, all of my spoiler videos, when I export them, it's like Daily Crim 1, Daily Crim 2, and I think of that time, like, oh, crim, this is the Crim set. <laughs> <laughs> so, preview started last week, and Wizards like drop like half the set on day one <laughs> i'm not mm -hmm. sure if they're getting mm -hmm. worse with pacing somehow they need to learn from drip marketing or something but we have a lot of cards a lot of mythics um planeswalkers a lot of things so just check it out at mpg previews if we don't cover it uh on the podcast but essentially the story is olivia valdarin is having a wedding we're all invited uh back on the plane of innistrad once again uh, so we'll go over some of the new mechanics, uh, some of the new cards and their flavor, and then uh, some interesting cards we we want to talk about. So first up, uh, Exploit, coming back. Uh, and it's coming back on Overcharged Amalgam. Uh, so two blue-blue, so four CMC, or four mana value, sorry. Three, three, creature, zombie, horror at rare. Flash, flying, exploit. When this creature enters a battlefield, you may sacrifice a creature. Uh, when overcharged amalgam exploits a creature, counter target spell, activated ability, or triggered ability. And remember, you can oh, exploit crim. yourself, so you can just sack yourself to the exploit Yeah, so, so the floor is four mana counter spell, because you can sack it to itself. Krim, what do you think of this? I really wanted to hear your opinion, because this seems like a very crimmy card. To me, it seems really powerful and like standard staple level powerful, but you're the control mage. Uh, how good is overcharged amalgam? I mean, it's nice that you can exploit. Um, you know, like itself, but I I don't think I'm playing this in a control deck, right? I mean, maybe maybe I am because I mean it is a disallow, but it is still four mana, and I mean I think this is better in like a zombie deck. <laughs> like this is actually just going to be better in some kind of tempo creature deck more so than it will be in a zombie. Or, I mean, a control deck 
Right, because like this, this it's not like I ever get a body to beat you down with. If I'm uh, using this, I'm probably gonna have to, you know, use it to a counter. Spell. I guess, I guess that's true. Control decks in our current standard, like what you might have a leer or two, you might have like a, a smoldering egg in some of the is it decks or something, but you really don't have a lot of exploit fuel. So that is a uh, that is a good point. I think the thing I love about this card is. I've called Decay Zombie tokens like fake creatures since they were printed, and I feel like Exploit is about the perfect mechanic to make a uh, to make Decay better. Like it seems so incredibly good with stuff like Jadar and Tainted Adversary, where you're just making these like somewhat useless creatures, and then you can turn them into useful creatures by turning Overcharged Amalgam into like a legit card. When you're exploiting a Decay Zombie, this card's kind of insane. Like counter something and leave a three three flying body for four on the battle field and yeah. you get the upside of like stifling a planeswalker activation or i don't know maybe some uh, weird ultimate. situation where yeah planeswalker <laughs> ultimate even just like stopping the token from ren for a turn a negative three on ren like even that's a pretty big swing so i think you're right it's probably not good in creature free control as a four mana counter spell but with kind of useless decay creatures this card seems really good yeah and i i think cards like you know like poppet stitcher are gonna like get even better right because now you just start uh, like chaining like you know a bunch of cheap spells like I mean I like the blue black Delver deck um, that card is really fun and st- or that deck is really fun and standard and this I think will go right into it eh <laughs> I think it's okay I, th- I think it's good but like you're asking a lot for it. it's just like four mana counter spell with like a little incremental value I don't know if that's like the end of the world so like yeah if you have like sacrifice synergies it's like these but like I, I don't know like, is this going mean, to overrun the, the standard? Body's, is this going to define the meta? The body's good. Not really. I mean, the, the other reason <laughs> I'm high on it is because this is like a, a reasonable main deck creature that gives you exactly what you need to stop uh, extra turn spells. Like, we, we see decks splashing into blue specifically to counter Alrin's Epiphany. Like, this is a, a card that it's a fine creature. A 3-3 three, three flyer for four is like, that's not super above the curve, but it's a reasonable threat. And it just happens to stop your opponent's Alrin's Epiphany or whatever. So I feel like it lines up really well with the meta just because counter spells are so valuable valuable at stopping extra turn spells i mean the question is is this yeah, better I mean, than a two mana counter spell or a three mana counter spell like is this body there's worth a body the premium exactly right is In, the body worth the premium oh, yeah. And especially when we have renin seven in the format where this three three body is kind of useless uh, but what if renin mm, seven doesn't resolve yeah or even better to think about this think about this they minus three and you trick them yeah i mean this is a terrible play you would never do this <laughs> You let them resolve the Ren and Seven, so you flex on them, so you counter the activation <laughs> yes. of the, the tree, and then you it, kill it. it, it but it then the opponent would go. of like F six through the counter. <laughs> and wait, yeah, crap. Exactly. Let me stifle the trigger to kill it with the body. It's okay. crim friendly. Okay, that's why I love this card. It gives me two shots to not mess up on Moto. Okay. Uh, all right. So that's exploit returning mechanic. Next up, we have uh, training. Comes on the card Savior of Allenbach. So one white, white, three mana value, mythic creature, human soldier, one, two, training. When this creature attacks with another creature with power greater, put a plus one, plus one counter on this creature. When Savior of Allenbach trains, exile up to one other target creature from the battlefield or creature card from a graveyard. When Savior of Allenbach leaves the battlefield, put the exiled cards onto the battlefield under their owner's control. So training is reverse mentor. And then we have like a fiend hunter slash reanimator uh, ability when, when it actually trains. They like to like to talk about how every mechanic is actually just kicker. I feel like every Boros mechanic is some form of training. Like every time it's something like, oh, when you attack, you get a counter on something. Although I feel like training like this card is kind of sweet. And if training is going to have a lot of things like this that trigger when something trains, at least that's a little bit of a twist compared to mentor and stuff that we've seen in the past. The card itself. ah, I don't know. I don't know if it's good. I like that it triggers when it leaves the battlefield. And I think what I'm most excited about is playing this in like a blink deck in commander or something uh where you're able to like play this 
exile something from your graveyard, train with it, and then you're able to, uh, you know, blink it with a Thassa or a Ephemerate or something and get that back and maybe do it again the next turn. So I think there's like Brago shenanigans and whatnot with this card. Uh, but as far as standard, there's just like a million good three drops and what you have Skyclaves, you got Brutal Cathars, you have Adeline. I'm forgetting like five of them, but like the white three drop slot is so overcrowded that I'm not sure this is enough to really see play in standard. I... Yeah, that's kind of the problem I've got with it, and it's mostly that I just feel like it's so packed, just like you had mentioned. And I, I mean, I, I think if it weren't for the fact that like Skyclave, Appetizer, and and whatever the three up, the, you got there's Paolo, like three other ones. You got Paolo, yeah, you, you got, got Brutal Paolo. Cathar, you got Adeline that sees play. Yeah. Uh, there's just so many. Exactly. Like wow. I, I mean, it's kind of, I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's just something that we're missing, and this cuts through. You know. I, but, like, I, I just don't see how this is going to cut through all the other cards. Yeah, I, I, cards. I mean, I was thinking at first, like, human, like, human tribal. But even if you just narrowly focus on humans, you still got Paulo, You still got Adeline. You still got Brutal Cathar. Like, even in human tribal, there might be so many good three drops that this doesn't make the cut, even though it is powerful. But uh, sorry, Richard, go ahead. I was going to say this card's unplayable. It's a three-mana one-two. <laughs> like, like, let's not forget, <laughs> right? Like, but it trains, it's, it, Richard. It it's, trains. It's chump attacking, right? So... You need to you need to train to remove the blocker that's about to murder this thing, right? And then what if they have another blocker? Like this thing can't attack through anything, right? It can't attack through like a two drop, right? Like a two mana three three <laughs> pack leader can't like I don't know how you would play this. I mean this human gets like straight bodied by a werewolf. It doesn't matter which it one. It gets bodied by like a one drop nowadays, right? Like, like you can't. Like I don't know. It's like I don't. You don't need to have some insane like combo synergy or something, right? Like I, I'm not gonna go through all these hoops and chump attack to hope to get some value, right? Like it needs to be an able body, and it's not three mana one two. You need another it creature. <laughs> you need to attack profitably. They need to have you know less than one blocker so you can actually remove it like it's just too much work so 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 why do you think this is at mythic then is it because this would just absolutely dominate in limited and just like snowball and win by itself if I mean, it was a rare you can reanimate yeah you can reanimate right so you can it, yeah. if you drop like a 10 drop in your graveyard right and you chump attack in then yeah you can reanimate that but it seems to to magical christmas land i mean maybe it is good i don't know <laughs> I, but like, yeah, like the the reanimate thing is cool, but no, wait, it's still, it's just, no, it's a one, two, <laughs> it's a one, two, if it did it on ETV, like if it did the Fiend Hunter thing, maybe it's okay, but like you need to actually attack and you need to have another creature to train and like, it's just a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. Probably not good enough. All right. Uh, next up, Alchemist Gambit, uh, <laughs> and it comes with cleave. So one red, red sorcery. Uh, at rare, cleave four blue, blue, red. So seven is it. Uh, you may cast this spell for its cleave cost. If you do, remove the words in square brackets. Uh, and the card text is take an extra turn after this one. During that turn, damage can't be prevented. Square brackets. At the beginning of that turn's end step, you lose the game. End square brackets. Exile Alchemist Gambit. So basically, I a three mana, this. take extra turn, you lose the game at the end of that turn. But for seven mana, it's a straight up, you take an extra turn, but it exiles itself, and uh, damage can't be prevented. That's a clause on this extra turn spell. I, I, this, is, this is what I think an extra turn should look like, right? Like, the, the fact that it can't first off hide away in the Fertel zone will help. The fact that it doesn't, I never thought I'd say this, but Richard, the fact that it doesn't put birds on the field <laughs> is, uh, is, is actually a blessing. And it kind of comes with that lose the game clause that I do like. If And I mean, also on top of that, the cleave mechanic feels like a typo, but I love it. <laughs> I, I think it is such an interesting card design. It's just like <laughs> if I if I read this like ten years ago, I thought you were I I would have thought you were trolling me, but legitimately this yeah. mechanic cleave is hilarious and I love it. I don't understand so, it like flavor wise. Oh this this card it's uh the timing's so bad because I feel like you're right. This is probably a, a safe-ish extra turn spell, but boy, 
uh, having it come out at a time when people are just on the warpath about extra turn spells and standard is a uh, just unfortunate timing. Uh, I'm a little concerned that this is going to add more redundancy to the is it decks. I, I've seen very mixed opinions on this card. Some people think it's unplayable and standard. Other people see it as like extra turn spells, you know, five and six, maybe something like that for the is it epiphany style decks. Do you think this card's going to be good in standard, Krim? Like, is there any concern that this further power? powers up the epiphany decks when we've spent the last few weeks talking about wanting to see epiphany decks powered down i don't think this is a card that's going to cease play in standard just because as i like the not having a bird is pretty big because a lot some of the decks are now just removing like they're like they're some of their threats they board into like a gold span they board into a you know a few of the eggs and whatnot but like this this just doesn't do it for me and on top of that like those decks would probably in this slot for extra turns five and six would rather just play the blue red flashback spell galvanic whatever right and then it copies the the turn spell giving you extra birds or whatever but it could also be utilized to copy maybe a removal spell so that spell might be more versatile than just holding on to an alchemist gambit so i just don't even think this card is like playable in standard i, I hate it I like must. i hate extra turns but <laughs> I think I'm most excited about the the fair mode of it, the three mana mode. I've always kind of liked the the cheap extra turn spells with the huge drawback of losing the game. And there's there's some shenanigans in standard, like it curves right into uh, overcharged amalgam, for example. You can like cast this, take an extra yep. turn, and then stifle the extra turn trigger with the overcharged amalgam. So I think there's some janky fun stuff that you can do with this card. What what do you think, Richard? Like, uh, should we be worried about turns being even better in standard, or is this just a, a jank card that doesn't matter? I am worried about this card. I actually, I, so I don't, so Epiphany is better. I don't know if you would slot this as five or six, like Krim said, there are other cards you could be playing, but I do feel the, the modal aspect of this card is very dangerous, right? The, the fact that you can pay three mana to take the extra turn, because oftentimes all you need is an extra turn, right? To stabilize, to win the game, uh, whatever, right? So like, like Seth said, you could, play this and then stifle the trigger you could play this and just kill him with your gold span uh the the option to cast it for three mana i think is actually pretty dangerous so i'm a bit wary of this card right and like seven mana extra turn is not that outrageous so the fact that you can kind of modal this and take the extra turn uh you know when, when you're desperate uh is scary and and usually with those cards like it's not worth the card in hand right like if you just have a card that's like take an extra turn and die afterwards like you're like uh, i'd rather just draw some action but this is just seven mana take an extra turn which in our standard is playable right so i don't know being able to do it for three mana when you're desperate to like chain together some extra turns or you know stifling the trigger later or you know other shenanigans i'm a little worried about this card i'm definitely a little frightened of gold span because i do think uh, in the like creature free is it builds this does get a little bit worse because you don't have many threats, but in the dragony is it builds, I feel like this card could be really good because there's definitely going to be times when we're like, oh, I got a couple of gold spans on the battlefield. Oh, I can just cast this for three mana off my treasure tokens and kill the win the next turn. Like, what do I need seven mana for? So I feel like there's just accidentally going to be times when the three mana mode is going to be super relevant in uh, in some of the decks in standard. What do you think of the mechanic? Uh, it's definitely inelegant. Do you, do you think there was a better way than like remove the cards in the bracket? This is actually one of the simpler ones because the brackets are just at the end. There are some cards that have like two or three sets of brackets interspersed throughout the, the rules text of the card. Uh, what do you think of just how the mechanic is formatted and works? Like I like how it plays, but I don't know. It's just a really clunky mechanic to read. Yeah, this is a terrible mechanic. Like you have to read the card twice and like you need to unconfuse yourself and like do some mental manipulation like they should just have like take an extra turn after this cleave take an extra turn after this like they should like repeat the text twice with the different things and just make it modal um but yeah i i find this very confusing to read like the the fact that you have to like delete cards reread it <laughs> and then parse what that means in your head and then if you didn't get it the first time you gotta do it again right and it's like very complicated so i'm actually quite surprised this made it out. This seems like someone thought it was a good idea, but like someone in design would be like, no one will understand this. New players will be super confused. But apparently they thought it was okay. Like deleting words in square brackets. <laughs> I, 
I want a, I want an artifact that's like one or two mana that just says remove all square brackets from the text of all cards. And then you can just cast them for the normal cost and get the cleave cost. I think that would be really sweet. <laughs> uh, okay, so next up, we have blood tokens coming on uh, Anji, Maid of Dishonor. Anji? Anye? I don't even... I, I, what was it? Ange? 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 I say Ange. 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 I think it's Anyi. Right? Angi? It's no, no, not there's not a G there. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I it's mean, that's what I remember from Commander. <laughs> we should have. Okay. I, thought, I thought we went over this last time and we learned nothing. Okay, so two yeah, we black, forgot. red, four mana value, Rakdos, legendary creature, vampire, coming in at rare, four five. Uh, when on on. <laughs> made of dishonor Ange. <laughs> and okay. or one or more other vampires enter the battlefield under your control create a blood token this ability triggers only once each turn uh pay two sacrifice another creature or blood token each opponent loses two life and you gain two life and the blood token itself is uh an artifact with pay one tap it discard a card sack it draw a card so basically a, a rummaging clue that only costs one mana to activate this card, I really want to be good. It's like Siege Rhino. This is like <laughs> Vampire Siege Rhino. If you think of it, it's a four or five for four, it's multicolored, it can drain the opponent. If this card is good as standard, I think standard's gonna be sweet. But my concern is this is the exact kind of like mid-rangey threat that has not really worked in standard very well recently. Uh, but I really want this card to be good in standard because I think it's a powerful effect. You play this, you get the blood token, you're probably playing a deck that can make blood tokens in other ways and then you're able to untap with this and just like sack two or three blood tokens and drain your opponent for six and win the game in your aggro deck uh, also a way to make your opponent lose life for vampires which is really relevant since a lot of the best vampires only do their thing if your opponent had lost life during the turn uh like florian for example is one of them so this is the way that you can make your opponent lose life and trigger your vampires without actually attacking. Plus, I think blood tokens are sweet. When I first read them, I was thinking, oh, this is just like bad clues. But when you consider like reanimation shenanigans, we're probably gonna talk about some reanimator cards in the future that are coming in this set. Uh, vampires having like a madness sub theme. This is like a great way to trigger madness in vampires in like commander or in older formats. I actually really like blood tokens and I think they're not actually bad clues. And in some decks, I think they're actually just way better than clues. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think the fact that you can discard is pretty major, like pretty major, right? Like, I mean, let's be honest, you're black and red. There's definitely no shortage of things to reanimate with. However, on Anji, Anj, I, I, I don't think she's uh, like actually like great or I, I don't I don't think they're great in uh, standard. Not Siege yet. Rhino. Siege Rhino. <laughs> Siege Rhino's unplayable Siege. in standard. It's not Siege Rhino. Oh. It's it's six mana. This is not Siege Rhino. It's six mana yeah. shock Siege Rhino, right? <laughs> it's not even Helix. It's the the new two mana spell that's from Midnight Hunt that has flashback. The one that deals to and gains you two. Like that. It, this this is not like as good as Siege Rhino. It's nice that it's a four mana four five. That's pretty cool. But I, I don't think this is better than, like, think about the four drops that are also in this color. You have the Indestructible Dragon, that's probably better, the one that you can sack a creature to that's free to sack, by the way. Like, the fact that this is two mana to activate makes me not like it. Or maybe I'm just spoiled by the power level of free sacks. But, but like, the, the thing here is, I think the, the Dragon's better. Um, and I think that the four slot for, I don't know what deck would want this, a Vampire deck? A Vampire deck would probably not want too many four drops. So... I just don't know what deck wants this right now. Uh, I, yeah. I'm not as high in the dragon. I don't really like Predator outside of sack decks. I, I always feel like if I'm just playing a generic deck, that I don't have stuff to sacrifice and it puts you in a really awkward position, but it is powerful in sack decks. But sorry, go, go ahead, Richard. Uh, do you remember Reaper of the Wild? <laughs> this was like Theros. This was like literally like a decade ago, yeah, right? Yeah. It was a four mana Golgari four five that like did something and everyone was like oh my goodness this is gonna this is gonna break standard look how power crept we are and uh four mana four five was not playable way back then it's still not playable now right like <laughs> best case scenario four mana four five it somehow survives you untap you pay four mana because that's how much mana you have and you you deal four damage uh sacking two clues right or sacking two blood and like is that good enough i i don't think that's good enough 
at all. It's also legendary. You know, you can't stack siege rhinos, right? A siege rhino cave at a time where you could blink siege rhino for more shenanigans, right? Like this does none of that. So unfortunately, I don't think it's playable at all, right? And I don't think you want blood tokens. Like you, if you try to use them for value, like you've already curved out, you're at four. You're trying to discard for reach, like you just should have just played a four drop that finished the game, right? Like, so I, I don't know. I just don't like this card. I'd be very shocked. And I agree with Seth that this is somehow playable. We're in a very good spot in standard, but I, I do not think this is playable at all. Aww. Wait, Seth thinks it is playable. But, but Siege Rhino. It's not but Siege, Siege Rhino. Rhino. And Siege Rhino, <laughs> I, would Siege Rhino um, be playable today? I don't even know if it would be playable. Uh yeah, I, I don't know if it would be either. I, I feel like the Vampire deck, it would be the home. I don't think you're just going to play in a generic mid-range deck, most likely, but I'm hopeful that this is good enough to have a home in Vampires, but I guess we'll have to we'll have to wait and see. Maybe it actually won't be, and I'll be disappointed, but I, I, I think that there's a shot it'll be good enough for Vampires. I'm not saying it's busted or like the best card <laughs> in the set or anything like that, but I think Vampire Tribal could want it. I would play a four Rhino four defined four a format. vanilla okay. <laughs> over this. <laughs> like is there is there an uncommon well, red card that's like a four man, a four four haste i think i'd play it over this there's, there's a, definitely there's a, four four haste and you know yeah. vanilla that's not powerful enough in the year 2021 that was better than this <laughs> i could get it four damage right <laughs> <laughs> that might actually end the game before you chain off extra spells uh, extra turns on me right <laughs> all right so next up, we have our returning planeswalkers. So we have Chandra dressed to kill, a uh, mythic planeswalker, one red, red, plus one, add red. Chandra deals one damage to up to one target player or planeswalker, plus one, exile the top card of your library. If it's red, you may cast it this turn, minus seven, exile the top five cards of your library. You may cast red spells from among them this turn. You get an emblem with whenever you cast a red spell. This emblem deals X damage to any target, where X is the amount of mana spent to cast the spell. Oh, I love this Chandra. This is this is my favorite style of Planeswalker. I feel like Chandra dressed to kill, really powerful, but also narrow. It's not an Oko that you can just jam in any deck and be good. You got to be basically mono red or very close to mono red for its abilities to work. But if you are mono red, you're essentially almost getting like a, a three mana mini version of a Chandra Torch of Defiance. Like you're generating card advantage with the plus ability. You got an emblem ultimate that will win the game as you cast a couple of spells you even get to ramp a little bit into like a gold span dragon or something so i think in the right shell some sort of like red aggro shell burn style shell chandra could actually at worst be a sideboard all-star that you bring in against control that doesn't have creatures to pressure it because it is bad at defending itself but at worst i think definitely in the conversation for sideboard slots and might even have some uh, main deck potential as well but i i think this card could actually be very strong yeah i actually i like this one i think this one's pretty good um and i mean it comes down to i i, I think this is like possibly at like playable in unfortunately is it dragons <laughs> right like it's oh, like it, it depends like if they're the creature heavy build or the more spell heavy and if they're spell heavy this could work i mean you don't want to exile your own extra turn spells but i do think that there's definitely some kind of spell slinger style deck with this and you know the egg and all of that. Maybe maybe there'll be two variations of is it, or maybe they'll just blend into one. Yeah, I, I see this card and I think gold span. And I think mono red dragons. I yeah. think you just ditch the blue. Uh maybe oh, okay. How about this? How about this? You use the new cleave extra turn spell, right? <laughs> so it's red. So it works with this, and you splash like blue mana base. <laughs> and you just basically Removal spell, Chandra, ramp into gold span, removal spell, and then just like murder someone. And, like, so we're fusing the Epiphany deck, right? With <laughs> like essentially that's what <laughs> that's the concern here. Ooh. What a what do you think about this card in older formats? Like I, I feel like when I read it, I was like a oh, mono this red could be pun? a burn card, or at least a burn yeah, like a mono red sideboard card. But the problem is so many formats are uh, burn decks are Luris decks now. So the cost yeah. is like pretty high because you're giving up your Luris to gain access to Chandra. I think if it wasn't for Luris being so good, I would think this might have a shot in like burn or mono red decks in uh, in like pioneer or historic or maybe even modern. But with Luris around, I think that kind of just kills its potential. To well, as, as somebody who 
absolutely does not like the new Jund. Uh, Richard. <laughs> no, no. I'm curious, Richard, would you play this in Jund? What, what am I wrapping into? Like, Storm Breath Dragon? Like, well, uh, like I don't know, right? <laughs> you definitely need to be wrapping with this thing. And I, I don't think you're playing with Jund. Like, I, plus, it's Jund. Like, the other, the, the middle plus one's not going to do anything. Like, half your cards are, like, not red. Okay. Or, like, 75% are not red. So... <laughs> Uh, no, but like maybe big red, yeah, I think or scred red, something like that. In modern, could see this Chandra, yeah, uh, could use this Chandra, yeah, Chandra tribal in uh, in historic. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to do that. Yeah. It just keeps getting better, by the way. Like this plus the uh, acolyte of flame, like oh, cool. and light up the night, light up the night, so good in the Chandra deck. That card is definitely yeah. a, definitely a sleeper, and that's one of the reasons I'm kind of a little excited for it in standard. Is it's just another cheap planeswalker that has a reasonable amount of loyalty, and I really want to light up the night deck to <laughs> to work in standard. It probably won't because I'll just get negated, but but <laughs> discounting <laughs> discounting that, I remove all the loyalty from my planeswalkers and uh, and get negated is like the most brutal. But other than that, it's really sweet. I, I really like the ramp d- deals damage. I think it's really good especially in older formats you can light up the stage or whatever with this like so yeah. i actually really like you don't have to choose between ramping and like dealing damage like you gotta do both i think that the other place in standard that's worth mentioning uh, mentioning is uh is vampires actually just because that ping is pretty valuable to turn on your your florians and like the two drop lord that only is lord if you ping something or deal damage to your opponent during the turn so maybe that that ping ability will give it some shot to show up in a vampire deck in standard all right, next up, we have Soren the Mirthless. Two black, black, four mana value, four starting loyalty, plus one. Look at the top card of your library. You may reveal that card and put it in your hand. If you do, lose life equal to its mana value. Minus two, create a two, three black vampire creature token with flying and lifelink. Minus seven, Soren deals 13 damage to any target. You gain 13 life. Okay, I, I, I think that... that- Alt is like probably like poo poo, but everything else is pretty cool. This card, I think the biggest thing here that we just didn't mention for the listeners at home is that there is a variant artwork done by the person that did Castlevania's art. And so this screams Alucard at first. And, and then I looked at it and I looked closer. It is actually just the artist that did Castlevania and the variant that is 100% Alucard is sick. Uh, and, and other than that, the normal artwork, very seductive. Yes, I, I, I see that the internet has gotten a little thirsty over the last couple of days. <laughs> Let's just go with that. And y'all need a little bit of like, par- like something to fill your parchness. Uh, but, but yes, I think the plus one is pretty sweet. That minus two drops a vampire nighthawk. I don't know if that's good enough in this standard. I think it should have been not Vampire Nighthawk, but the Rogue one, where it's equal to uh, the stuff in your opponent's graveyard. That had probably Ooh. been better. Um, which for it's a mythic, right? It's a it's a it's a mythic. Okay, this it should do something mythical, right? Uh, minus seven is. I guess okay. I mean, I feel like this card's good. I think it's, I, I think this card has to be good. When you just read the the combination of abilities and mana cost and loyalty, uh, like the plus one, it's like a, a dark confidant that you can actually play with expensive cards because you have the option not to put it in your hand and take damage. Uh, so you can actually play like six drops in your dark confidant deck. So. That's a powerful ability. Should be drawing an extra card most turns. You can That's negative cheating two tr- though. <laughs> it is a little the, weird that cards. It's can't not have greatness at anymore. any cost. Yeah, they're, it's they're, not they're, great. <laughs> it's greatness at a cost. Sor- <laughs> Soren's too cool for that. He's he's too cool for for greatness at any cost. Um, he, Man, he's he just like hasn't a flipped enough two stalkers. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the negative two you can use twice in a row. I was gonna say it should have been a literal vampire nighthawk. I think the upgrade I wanted to see was not so much get a ton of power like the rogue, but just get death touch and be an actual vampire nighthawk rather than just flying in life oh, link. I think. Even- have death touch it does not have death touch so just well, this card is blank. not good <laughs> and then the ultimate though it's not exciting but i think the ultimate 
is going to be lethal a lot of the time. Like 13 damage is that's a big chunk of your opponent's life total, especially if you're playing aggro or vampires or something where you're getting an early damage. So I think someone's got I, I think someone's got potential just plus to draw a card every turn and negative to defend your Soren with a with a token. I think just those two abilities on a four mana planeswalker might be good enough for standard. I won't lie to you. I didn't know that. Wow. OK, I thought it gave death touch like it was actually just vampire Nighthawk. It should have. <laughs> I think it should have. But yes. No, it, it's yeah, a little was... a little worse. Oh, yeah, this is playable. I think yeah, maybe like sideboard option, maybe certain <laughs> matchups, but like you're not going to spend four mana for a two, three flying lifelink. <laughs> All right. Two, and like, two, two, three. So you get to do it twice. You get to do it twice. It takes you two well, turns, you gotta, though. You got to don't come kill down off your sword. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I don't think that's where, like, I don't know that that's where you want to be at four mana, like drawing cards for the long. Remember, you're, you're, you're against a clock, right? Like, you're either trying to beat Epiphany, which means you need to kill them, or you're playing against Mono Green, where this two three is like doing literal you. nothing, <laughs> right? Yeah, so like you have much. to you have to actually win the game or provide substantial advantage. Like yes, maybe this stops Mono White, but like I, even then, very questionable, <laughs> the <menace. laughs> right? Like, but you have Life Link. Like, maybe you can live against Aggro, but I don't think it does enough. I, I don't think. I think it needs to be like a lot more aggressive or a lot more value than like what it what it has. I think it's just in a weird spot in the meta. The other thing that we haven't brought up that maybe we should now because we're talking about Soren, uh, they brought back Godzilla card styles. Krim mentioned a a card style featuring Soren, but there are also Bram Stoker Dracula card styles, like straight up from the books. Uh, so Cor uh, Soren is also Count Dracula. What do you guys think of uh, of the Godzilla card styles coming back in the in this run of them? I love it. I think like I don't know the Bram Stoker like you know actual like story books because you know I don't even read my own magic cards. So why would I read a whole book? <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, magic cards basically are books these days. Text yeah, that's true. Like, it's similar, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, like I do love the artwork. I think it looks really cool. Um, and now it almost makes me want to read a book. Like it's not in panels, so or it's not a comic, so it's oh, I can't read the anime read it. adaptation. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give, give me the manga adaptation. I want to read it from right to left. <sighs> yeah, I like it. Weird. So, so for for people unaware, so we have the normal card version. Okay, we have showcase, and they're calling them the um, the Fang uh, showcase and. That one has the Castlevania art uh, or artist. And then uh, I don't know what the other showcase is. There's the other like black and white like uh, Equinox or uh, Eternal et Night. Eternal Night. Yeah, I think it's Eternal, Eternal Night. Night showcase. And then you have the actual Dracula cards, which are templated like Godzilla. So, for example, Soren is actually Count Dracula. And then under that, you have Soren the Mirthless. Uh, so we have multiple versions of uh, these cards. And there's a lot of Dracula cards. There's like two, four, six, seven, eight or something right now. And they seem to be still coming out. I mean, they have a Van Helsing, so that's pretty cool. So, yeah. But, like, how relevant? Has anyone seen Dracula? Like, the movie? <laughs> yes. Like, anytime uh, recently? A long time. A long time ago. Yeah, not not recently, but a long time ago, I have. I watched Has anyone the, read the, uh, books? the Netflix Dracula that, like, became a comedy i guess halfway through <laughs> <laughs> i also read the book a long time ago it's, it's been a while since i've had any any dracula <laughs> interactions but i don't i think it's pretty iconic though right i mean like is it any less iconic than godzilla or is 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 dracula like more outdated these days i guess you don't get a dracula Dracula's movie a every couple outdated, years no? there's like yeah, new maybe. godzilla movies coming out like all the time right do you think these will be popular or are you expecting them to be less popular than like Godzilla because because it's an older franchise? I I don't know. I, I don't yeah. I don't care for any of these, actually. Maybe maybe Thalia, Vita Harker. She looks badass. But like, <laughs> I don't know any of these people. I'm like, who's Vita Harker? I don't know. Right. Uh, so I mean, I know, it just seems weird. Like we're having Fortnite and Street Fighter cards and then we're having like Dracula. Like <laughs> it seems like total. It seems like this is something like my parents would watch or something, right? Like, I, I barely remember Dracula. It seems like a very dated thing, but I'm not sure. Maybe there's like a huge cult following for Dracula somewhere that I'm not aware of. There is Castle Dracula, which is supposed to be Voldaren Estate. I think that's pretty dope. But yeah, like I, I didn't read this, so I'm not familiar with it. But tell me that it would not have been better as what we do in the shadows. 
<laughs> now, if you don't know what we do in the yeah. shadows is it's a mockumentary style, at least the movie was, uh, about a bunch of vampires living together. And it's just like it's a comedy. And then, of course, the TV show is even it's just absurdly hilarious. It's got Taika Waititi. So, you know, it's going to be funny. So, yeah, like I think that is a little more current and it's got vampires. And every time I look <laughs> at Count Dracula, the the card, um, I keep looking, I keep thinking of Nandor. <laughs> <laughs> so for the listeners at home if you know who that is you know what i'm talking about and if they can print colin robinson and just make him a stacks piece that'd be amazing i mean i will say that uh, these cards seem well received compared to other ip crossovers it seems like there's no no pushback at all really about the godzilla card style so at least that's a win i think yeah i, I haven't seen a big good. amount of outrage or anything from the <laughs> we've community. accepted fortnite we'll accept dracula i think <laughs> I think Wizards has done it. Wizards, Wizards has successfully converted everyone. Oh, it's just Dracula. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm waiting for the serial next. Like, give me, give me, give me Choc- <laughs> Count Chocula or whatever. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, where were we? So that was Soren, aka uh, he was actually Dracula, right? Yeah, he was actually Count Dracula. Uh, yeah. So next up, the star of the set, Olivia Crimson Bride. Uh, wait, is this the right, is this the right, hold on, it is, okay, uh, six mana, so four black, red, three, four, legendary creature, vampire noble, flying haste, when Olivia attacks, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, taps and attacking, it gains, when you don't control a legendary vampire, exile this creature. Oh, oh. Six mana is a lot. Six mana is a heavy cause, but this card does a lot right away. Like, coming down with haste and smashing for three and reanimating something to smash, like, that's a lot of damage coming off the top of your deck, potentially. I don't know. I don't I don't know where this is going to make it, if this is going to make it in standard or not. I feel like it's really high power, and it does pass the test of, you know, dodging sorcery speed removal. But uh, do vampires even want a six drop? I can count the number of, like, six plus mana creatures that see play in standard on, like, two or three fingers. It's like Coma, sometimes Cyclone Summoner, and uh, maybe the, the six drop Werewolf Grave Titan thing. Like, that's about it. There's not many six mana plays that actually show up in standard, but I think the card is definitely a powerful card. Oh, what do you guys think? Can this be a standard all-star? I, I wish it were a 4-4 four, four or like a 4-5, you know, for six mana. <laughs> like Getting through gold spans and some of the dragons, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, like it the doesn't fact that get you... through any of the flying creatures we play <laughs> in standard. <laughs> Gold span, <laughs> red and seven tokens. <laughs> yeah. like, or six man, it's like a three, four chump attacker. <laughs> However, that it, Seth is right though. It does do a lot when it comes down, but I don't think this is going in vampires. I think this is going in a black red or a Grixis mid range deck. Um and and yeah, like I <laughs> just like you had mentioned though, it really does get like swatted down by every other flyer <laughs> in the air. But and it costs one more mana to do that. So Right now, I'm not, I'm not feeling too good about its stats. That's the big issue. It, yeah, it needs a, a combo piece. It needs to be where you play it, you reanimate something, and you win the game Like with that combo. Outside of that, like, six mana, three, four, dies to gold span dragon. Like, it's not a good look. So, it's weird. Like, I don't think she'd be too OP at, like, four mana, three, four, flying haste, right? Or... Something like that. So I don't know why she's so expensive. Uh, like I don't maybe know, four mana, three, four with the reanimate. That's a bit <laughs> saucy, dude. That's a bit saucy. Is I it? Mean, we, you could just you uh, could just kill it, right? And four it mana, does nothing, three, right? four. That's pr- I, like that's that's saucy with haste and everything that it does. I don't know if we could have it there. I think it'd be we, five mana. We do have a lot of ways to fill the graveyard. We got the blood tokens. We got a ton of mechanics. Like, I don't know. Maybe you can reanimate a coma or something. I feel like if this was too aggressively costed, it would probably be really scary and, like, not, I don't know, not fun in standard. But I do think it could have had a, a bit of a stats boost. Like, at least let it trade with a gold span or something. Like, that's, ugh, three, four it's, is, uh, like, really rough stats. She's one of the stars of the show. She shouldn't trade with a gold span. Yeah. She should eat the that's gold span. That's also legendary, right? Like, yeah. I, I, they went very conservative with this. Like, I think even at four, five, or five, six, unplayable. Like... By the time you get to six mana, you kind of need a win, right? So, like, the stats well, can be a lot stronger. 
Okay, if, what about... If it were a 5-6, that'd be really good, actually, because then you could swing, reanimate Goldspan or something. That's 9 damage in the air. I See, like, that's a real clock, right? That's what you should have to pay, for, or that's what you should get when you're paying 6 mana. And on top of that, you know, it's Olivia. You know, I, I, I get it. We don't want to, like, make, you know, face cards too strong, but she's the one of the face cards. Okay, so we, we kind of trashed it for standard. Is it a Commander All-Star? I when I saw oh, yes. it, I was like, ugh. I mean, it's good in Commander. I don't know though. Like, it's not Edric, right? Is this even like your go-to Commander to build around, or do you just jam this in the ninety-nine of like Edric or something? Wait, Edric? I want a hundred. Would would or, I'm sorry, Edgar? not Edric. Edgar, <laughs> Edgar. Yeah, the vampire one. Yeah, yeah, yeah the other E name. <laughs> but yeah, like, is this even going to be a popular Commander to build around? There's so many legendary vampires that do interesting <laughs> oh. and powerful things. Or is this just a ninety-nine card? Edgar is a very high bar, so I, I'm gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna, like, because I feel like that is unfair. But what about but, old Olivia, even? Like, uh, Olivia, the pingy, steal your stuff old one, is so much better. Sure, like, isn't this, like, the fifth best Rakdos vampire commander or something? I believe it only put in your deck is... if you're playing a vampire deck. <laughs> it's, like, pretty questionable, right? I think, so like, just play is there a better reanimator? Is there a better reanimator commander? That's the question. Hmm. Oh, a like better I, I, you know, no. you, you, you use this to yes. reanimate. Chainer. Yeah, Chainer's much pretty better good. Hmm. But I like this as a vampire card. Um, and I, I specifically vampire with a reanimator theme because, okay, when it attacks, it turns target creature from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped and attacking, and it gains when you don't control a legendary vampire. So does that mean even if Olivia's gone and I control another vampire? It yeah. sticks around, yeah. So, yeah. so you do. Oh, this, it this does is great. kind of incentivize you to play more legendary vampires in your deck for sure. Yeah, this card's sweet. I think it's super sweet in commander. I it's at the very worst in the ninety nine, but I could totally see it being a commander. It is sweet in reanimator decks because it like doubles your reanimation. Like you'd reanimate this, and then it attacks and reanimates something else, and you kind of get two cards with your reanimator or whatever that you use to reanimate. So I feel like that is pretty pretty strong in a reanimator deck for sure. All right, next up we have uh, Maniform Hellkite. Four mana, two red red, uh, four four. It's a mythic. It's uh, it's non-legendary. It's just a dragon. Flying, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, create an XX red dragon illusion creature token with flying in haste, where X is the amount of mana spent to cast that spell. Exile that token at the beginning of the next end step. I love this card so much. At four mana, this is amazing. Also blocks Olivia. But the thing here is... <laughs> like, this card is sweet, right? Like, this is kind of like the red version of whatever mentor cycle. And, or, I mean, no, it's not. Actually, but this is way better. This this is able to constantly spawn an army whenever you cast a spell. And in a spell slinger deck, uh, potentially with Chandra Dress to kill. I, I think Dragons is, like, looking pretty juicy. Like a spell slinger deck or something. This looks pretty fun. I think this card's I think this card's busted. I'm like so scared of this card. This might be the card I'm most scared about in standard. I feel like this uh interacts pretty well with uh expensive extra turn spells. Like you cast an Elrun's Epiphany, Are you're those not just getting playable? two birds. You're getting a <laughs> you're getting a seven seven or a six six haster <laughs> and an extra turn. Like, I don't know how you lose if you untap with this an extra turn spell in hand. I think it just like wins the game. The only question is like, where does it fit in those decks? Could it be better than like smothering egg, maybe in the is it dragon decks? I think there's a shot that it is. It, it's kind of like the, the red shark typhoon. Would shark typhoon being on the battlefield or like metallurgic summonings? You don't get the long game, like build up a big board and slowly kill someone. But you play this and you just sling some spells and you're going to kill people super, super fast. Also, you can do shenanigans with like casting stuff on your opponents and stuff. That's one of the downsides is the tokens do go away. But if you cast your memory deluge on your opponents and step, the beginning of the next end step has already come. So you're going to keep that through your turn and be able to smash with that so i think this card's gonna see a lot of standard play we got a lot of really good dragons right now maybe it's not quite gold span good but it is definitely at the top of the next tier of dragons in standard and i'm really I mean, frightened about how good this same is deck be. yeah <laughs> Man I think, form is I think not replacing gold span oh. yeah oh frightening absolutely frightening in standard so moonvale moonvale regent or mana form hellkite mana form hellkite that's and, the question, oh, right? Actually, and like that, a gold span is staying, right? So, <laughs> so I think they go in different decks. 
I like I like Moonvale a lot in aggro decks where this uh, it's kind of the top of my curve where I kind of dump my hand and then I play it and I use it to refuel burn Boros aggro uh, with decks that have more expensive spells and it is a little bit awkward if you're playing like is it dragons you don't necessarily want to be discarding all of your you know uh, removal spells it's a and counter spells it's a that you're holding on to but it still loses a lot of the value I think because you're not drawing cards with it like in aggro you're consistently drawing cards I feel like in is it dragons you say no a lot to your moon veil because you don't want to be discarding the cards in your hand i feel like in it is a dragon style deck i would definitely go with this over moon veil like i think 100 percent. i think in a, a spell heavy is it deck or grixis deck this card's going to be an insane finisher yeah I, th- I think this card is absolutely nutty i love it mono red dragons with chandra oh. <laughs> that's what i'm banking on it's happening it's, a, it's a chandra's even a non-creature spell right so it's going to make a three three a hasty three three that's that's busted but so still. I did play Mono Red Dragons currently in standard for a video, and I will say that Diminishing Hope or whatever, Vanishing Hope really pantses the idea of a dragon deck. I'm just let you know that right now, because if I spend <laughs> my whole turn to play this and then you send it back to my hand, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up we have Necro Duality, four bad of value, three to blue, uh, mythic enchantment. Whenever a non-token zombie enters a battlefield under your control, create a copy or a token that's a copy of that creature. Best card in the set. So far, by far, I absolutely love this card. It's like a it's like a super zombie panharmonicon. Like we have ref- uh, reflections of the Jara, which has proven itself to be really, really bad. But this is so much better because it triggers when it comes into play. You can do reanimation shenanigans. Zombies aren't super legendary heavy anyway, which is one of the other problems with the reflections of the Jara. I think this card is really, really good. In standard, I'm just imagining like you play this, you play a champion of the pair, you get a copy of it, that puts a token on the first one, then you cast another another zombie and that's going to make two zombies that put a whole bunch of counters on your champion of the parishes so i think it's insane in essentially any zombie deck it's got combo potential it goes infinite with blade wing the risen reanimator shenanigans it goes infinite with grave crawler in like ashnod's altar whatever it is uh, not ashnod's altar the other one Fraxian altar in commander i think if you're playing a zombie deck this just it goes in it and it's absolutely absurd and it's going to be a really really powerful card this is a card i want to build around what about- from the entire set what about in standard? In standard, I think this has a role in zombies still. I think it does. Like, uh, standard zombies care about uh, being able to be exploited, and you have uh, extra creatures that you can exploit. And I feel like just copying a, you know, a pseudo lord or a champion of the parish, like, I think that that's enough to make it worth it. Like, I'm definitely going to try it, and it might be that I'm biased, and I just love cards like this. It's my favorite style of cards to build around, so maybe I'm overrating in standard, but I actually think it has a shot in standard. And being an enchantment, it dodges Prismari command, it dodges a braid that's being reprinted. Like, there's a lot of incidental artifact hate, which makes playing actual panharmonicon really really tough these days but enchantments a little bit more resilient i think as far as main deck hate so i think it's actually got a shot in standard zombies too i don't i don't know if this is something i like in standard zombies i love it oh, in you commander <laughs> i will show I, you i, I will show I mean, you yeah. I, or die trying <laughs> I just, oh you're gonna I die like trying the, <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like the curve of Par- champion of the perished is, is a little awkward if that's my one drop because i want that early right <laughs> so if i'm getting necro duality value you know like i'm either a over committing and it's a win more or i've already lost my board and i'm slowly rebuilding that's true i, I think that's true th- this card is like what's exactly what's wrong with standard right it's like four mana it's like a value uh a, a value card but like you need to either like win the game immediately because someone's about to take four extra turns so like getting value like does nothing but it's too slow so you can get run over by like the hyper aggressive like big beefy decks <laughs> so like it kind of does nothing it's like we never really saw panharmonicon uh you know like as a strong card in standard or like you know any of those like uh anointed procession like doubling season like those type of cards like they just don't add enough value and like we're too fast for this so i i could see this like if you, if there's a good zombie deck this is in your sideboard for like some weird grindy matchup but normally we don't have grindy matchups right like you either win or you get killed like pretty quickly so i i don't like this curve i, I think if we had like good mid-range zombies it'd be okay but the zombie deck's an aggro deck so i don't know you're trying to get value here you're just trying to kill them all right yeah. so what about commander I mean, then 
a hundred percent of this, this zombie oh, decks include. Yeah, include. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is amazing. <laughs> this thing is nuts. Yeah. In in Commander, I I fully agree. This is like amazing. It's there's just S-tier. no way you don't play it. S S S tier. The the price of this card will be insane. Yeah, it's gonna be super expensive. I mean, all the random like rooftop storm and stuff are surprisingly expensive for their rarity. So I expect this card to also be pretty pricey. And I'm gonna do my best to make it work in standard. I'm probably overly optimistic or blinded by my love of this style of card, but I'm definitely gonna try it because it's similar to Panharmonicon, if you can untap with it and not be dead, you're gonna have a really good turn and probably pull pretty far ahead. The question is, can you afford to take off a turn four? And you might be right. In a world of uh, needing to race epiphanies and a lot of decks being super aggressive to try to race epiphanies it might just be impossible to take your turn four off to do this but oh, i'm gonna give it my best shot to make it happen because it's gonna be sweet when it works turn four is just so important like yeah like you're gonna tap over this i'm gonna play gold span i'm gonna hit you and you're gonna make an additional <laughs> champion of the parish and then you're never gonna take a turn again to attack with them. <laughs> <laughs> value got him <laughs> But do I you paid see four this? mana to get two one ones. <laughs> Got there. Uh, well, they see each other, right? Yeah, I they grow each, each other. other. It's a com- oh, combo, <laughs> and you'll never get to attack with them again. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's a good point, though. You need to play another four drop to come out even on mana, right? <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> like if you if you play like a two drop, like you didn't really get anywhere, right? You spent six mana for four mana value combined, right? So you really need to chain off or win or like maybe there's some infinite combo you can do with this that will actually make it like very desirable we're kind of lacking a good follow-up too. part of well, like the brief moment when panharmonicon was good it's when you could follow it up with cloud blazer and like draw four and gain four to catch you up from falling behind i don't think we have that with zombies in standard i think the best five drop is <laughs> probably uh i i don't even know rock Claw Gargantuan or like Carfno Kennel Master. They're just like not very playable cards. So we'll have to see a good five drop zombie from the rest of Crimson Vow would go a long way towards improving uh improving this card. It, you know, we still have time for a zombie goldspan dragon. So if we get a <laughs> we get a zombie goldspan dragon, we're in business. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, then that one's the truth. All right. Now that, actually, no, I still don't even know if that's good enough to make this card. You really just cannot take turn four to do nothing. All right. Uh Tox roll the corrosive. A seven mana value, five black black, seven seven mythic legendary creature slug horror. At the beginning of each end step, put a slime counter on each creature you don't control. Creatures you don't control get minus one, minus one for each slime counter on them. Whenever a creature you don't control with a slime counter on it dies, create a 1-1 one, one black slug creature token. Blue, black, sacrifice a slug, draw a card. <laughs> I, I love this card. And Commander. <laughs> it, this card is amazing in Commander. It's officially group slug. But... <laughs> In in re- like in sixty card formats, this card is very much so not playable. <laughs> like, I mean, it is, it, it, uh, not playable might be a little harsh. I don't think it's that good, but I mean, imagine like living long enough to drop this against like mono white or something. This is just gonna wreck them, right? Uh, aren't the the slime counters just gonna add up and wipe their board away or whatever? <laughs> there the is no shortage wreck mono white. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah like that. <laughs> You've, it, it, you've already beaten mono white if you've casted this fairly right it, <laughs> because you, <laughs> it, it combos with sludge monster have you guys seen this combo sludge monster turns all creatures with slime counters into two twos and make them lose all abilities so if they both stick out for one turn they're gonna die and you just wrath the entire you just cast like of... a four mana wrath like what, <laughs> yeah. are we, what are we doing here what about meat hook massacre you know that card that card's pretty <laughs> I'm not saying it's good, but I don't think it's, like, the most unplayable card that I've ever seen in Standard. Like, it's really powerful if it gets on the battlefield. It's still 7 mana, but... To be fair, though, if if you play against dragons and they take an extra turn, the end of their turn, they lose their birds. God. God. Oh, that's... Oh, oh, wait a minute. This card card is on the map. Hold on. It's on the map. But then they're just gonna, you know, diminish or whatever, fading hope, and then you know, just you paid seven mana to get it bounced back to your hand for one. Oh. I think that in Commander, this is one of the commanders I'm most hyped to build around. Uh, Slug Tribal, probably not going to be much of a thing. There's uh, not a ton of slugs in Magic, but I think this is a really cool, like, 
dagger burn style commander where your goal is to like give your opponent creatures with clack bridge troll or like hunted phantasm or whatever and then wipe them away and get a ton of slugs for them so i think there's like a really sweet style of deck that you can build around tox roll and even just like played fairly because it triggers each end step that means once around the table all your opponent's stuff's getting negative four negative four that's kind of just like a wrath that's sitting out and eating things away and making you a ton of slugs as it go along so i agree in commander it's gonna be it's gonna be a super sweet card that i'm super excited to build around i i am curious though like you know like the, how miserable this will play in real life like upkeep wise <laughs> you know how many counters you're gonna have to bring to the table every time <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and they're they're not even negative one, <coughs> negative one counters, which makes it even more awkward that you can have like <laughs> stuff with slime counters and negative one, negative one counters on them. And then like if Toxtral goes away, the slime counters don't really do anything, but they still exist. But the negative one, negative one counters do. So, yeah, I do think it's it's a little bit complicated. Like, could they have just made it negative one, negative one counters? Like, do you think the slime is just for flavor purposes or do you think there's actually like a a gameplay balancing reason to make them slime counters. You can recast, so you can talk to put slime counters and everything. Uh, and then like someone kills talk and then you recast those slime counters still count, right? That's true. I, I and believe you can, so. Yeah. And you can put them on things with sludge monster combo that puts a, a slime counter on something. So <laughs> we got these slime Ooh. synergies adding up. You, you can pull slime time live stuff, is, right? like, there is are many things real. you can do with this. Um, but yeah, it is a seven mana seven seven that will instantly get killed if you don't have lightning greaves on it. So, <laughs> I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like a lot of people let stuff live. <laughs> this, <laughs> I don't think. I mean, you can't let this live though, because it's just gonna eat your board away. Like it's just uh, you it, can't let it live in commander. It's like a decree of pain that's like slowly happening. <laughs> I mean, rip to me and like my humans deck because it gets around indestructible and all that stuff. But like outside of that, like <laughs> what dragons don't care. Most tribes in commander will. I don't know. I feel like it can, It is a target that will eventually have to die. I do agree there. Like, you play this and the table will have to kill you. Not because, like, you know, they don't like you or anything like that. They just have to actually kill your card. All right. Next up, we have Curse of Hospitality. Two in a red. It's a rare enchantment aura curse. Enchant player. Creatures attacking enchanted player have trample. Whenever a creature deals combat damage to enchanted player... That player exiles the top card of their library until end of turn. That creature's controller may play that card and they may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast that spell. It's the the curse of the stupid monkey. <laughs> it literally turns all of your <laughs> creatures into rock. Into rock <laughs> they should it's... call it curse of Ragavan. Oh my god. <laughs> and it's just like a close up of Ragavan's face <laughs> smiling. <laughs> I mean, this card's insane, right? Isn't this like the one of the best curses they've ever printed? I mean, I feel like right, let's start with Commander. Like, obviously, in Commander, you put this on someone. Everyone attacks that person for a curse of opulence <laughs> to get a single treasure. Everyone's just going to murder the poor person that has this on them to try to steal and cast their cards. If there's a downside in Commander, it's the person's going to die so quick. I don't know if it's going to get back around for to your turn for you to be able to attack them and draw some of their cards. But I feel like you. this is like an auto-include. Why would you not play this in any red base? creature deck in commander and i also think it could be good in 60 card formats curses in general aren't but slamming this in like werewolves or something if not in the main deck out of the sideboard and just like trampling up your team and stealing some of your opponent's cards that actually seems really solid to me i don't know maybe i'm overrating this card but i feel like this is just like maybe the best curse that's ever been printed or at least one of them i mean in commander this is very strong and now, Seth, for someone who advocates for maybe we can mill them out, this is real. <laughs> this is real, of course. It's happening, finally. They'll, <laughs> Thank they'll you, die well before they get <laughs> milled, but I mean, yeah. I, I think this is a very, this is like probably one of the most brutal and powerful curses for Commander. In 60 card format, you know, the fact that it gives you, does it give you a treasure? No, no treasure. It's not, Trample it, and, and rock. It's not literal it's, monkey. <laughs> yeah. It, you it, just it get doesn't to take quite. the card. You have then to spend, it's not, it's, it's not spend good. Mana. It's not yeah. good. It's not good enough then for standard. It's but the, it is I'd rather just play Divination. Mid. Like, I think that's a better, <laughs> that's a higher EV play if you actually had a Divination. Uh, oh, because we you have to spend the mana. We play Siphon Insight. We play Siphon Insight, though. I mean, Siphon Insight is the truth. Flashback. 
you don't need to connect with combat damage. Yeah, yeah. okay. I guess I go in different. There's a lot so of you can hoops. save the card for whatever you want. <laughs> uh, you wait till they scry. <laughs> that's true. In Commander, I think this is like the worst card they've ever printed. So it's like <laughs> auto include in every deck, and it guarantees the death of a person. Like, 100%, right? And, you know, they were just talking about play design or whatever for Commander, and they're like, how much net fun are cards? And this is I a lot of net they, fun. <laughs> they decided to remove one player from the game, and the <laughs> remaining three players take all the fun of that, like, dead player. Uh, this will get to the top of Salt tier lists. <laughs> I, I think, like, <laughs> you're just trying to play a game of Commander, and someone, you know, slaps this curse on you. Your game is over, right? Like, you have to. I don't know. It. Is it? We get to really play your deck for you. So <laughs> we'll see your deck, right? I feel like this is maximum fun. The, the saving grace is they may not want to kill you because they want to keep the cards that they played <laughs> from your deck. You're like, oh, you got to keep them alive. I don't want to lose my, like, uh, Grave Titan. <laughs> They're our blood bag. <laughs> this yeah. is, like, so bad. Like, the player who gets this on them, like, has to remove it or else they... And no one will help you remove it. You you must remove it yourself, right? Can't and wait to do that in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, so, I don't actually know if it's a good thing. I, it is going to lead to some salty games where one person just gets killed for really no good reason. Uh, like, you just kind of just kind of get smacked. And it's going to happen pretty quickly. Like, it even gives creatures trample so they can trample you over your blockers. So you can, yeah, yeah, you can't like... even chump block. It's just like, oh, my goodness. It is really brutal. Is it too good? So they should have just not printed it, you think, for a commander? You think this is actually just too good for a commander? Like, in terms of the remaining three players alive, I don't think it's too good, right? Like, it's like, okay, right? But it, like, ruins the game for one person. So, because it's, like, theoretically symmetrical, right? If I, if I throw it on Seth, everyone else gets to draw a card off Seth, and then Seth dies. Like, we're kind of <laughs> equal. It didn't get too much. Maybe I'm at disadvantage because you're dead before I get to draw my card, right? Uh, but, like, Seth doesn't get to play anymore. And I think that goes against the spirit of the format. And for no good reason, it is very hard to interact with. You must have enchantment removal right there on the spot, right? You need to have mana up and remove it before you get murdered. So, I actually think... And in this also it's terrible. It's like it's like you might as well just arm again in me, right? Like, like I don't know, right? As somebody it, who will probably get this curse ninety nine percent of the time at every pod, <laughs> I think this is still hilarious. <laughs> I'll get like, Tomer sometimes, Scrim. Don't worry, I'll, I'll get Tomer sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. So like one in ten games, maybe someone else will get it, but I expect to always be the target of this card, and it is and, hilarious. This card is awesome. And it's not even draw a card. It's whenever a creature deals combat damage. So it's not like you're some of the curses, like the treasure one. It's like, okay, I need to hit them with a creature so I get the treasure, but I can send the rest someplace else. This doesn't just incentivize you to attack them with a <laughs> creature. It incentivizes you to just swing your entire board because the more you hit them with, the more cards you draw, like the more candy comes out of the pinata. So I feel like, yeah, this card, oh. I don't even know. I mean, I think it's super powerful, but I'm kind of worried about what it's going to do to Commander. Uh, I, I expect this to be something that playgroups, like, maybe end up house banning or something, or rule zeroing out. Like, I think it could just ruin the fun for some people. Just We'll just go to the RC committee's playgroup and slap it down on them every game. <laughs> and they'll, it'll get banned fast enough, right? Like, I can't imagine they keep this card. I, I feel if people play it and it's popular, it just creates a bad time. Uh, okay, we're running long, but last card. We got to hit the meme card. Uh, Grawlnock, the Omnivore, two green, blue, three, three, legendary creature, frog, <laughs> at rare. Whenever a frog you control attacks, mill three cards. Whenever a permanent card is put into your graveyard from your library, exile with a croak counter on it. You may play lands and cast spells from among cards you own in exile with croak counters on them. And Wizards. of course, the frog has an arm in his mouth. <laughs> Wizards. Wizards has broken the way to design commanders for bad tribes, I think. We it started with, like, Toski. We saw it with Tovalar. Like, when you have a really janky under-supported tribe, just make the commander draw a ton of cards, and it's going to be good enough. Like, frogs aren't great, but if you're drawing two or three cards every time you attack with one of them, you're maybe going to get enough frogs that you can actually win a game of commander. So I think that uh, Grolmok is actually a pretty sweet frog commander. I, I don't think frog tribe is going to be good, but it's definitely a pretty powerful leader for that tribe. So the problem is there's 32 frogs, okay? So if you didn't know, they took a bunch of, like, old frogs from, like, uh, the old sets that used to be beasts and changed them into frogs. However, 
a lot of them are outside of the simic colors. So if we just look at uh, simic colors, we have 23 frogs. So we, we lose like uh, a bunch of frogs. So still playable, but not as many frogs. Probably you been can't play die. the best frog, get rog, right? Get yeah. rog is black. Uh, I mean, the best frog is Yargle, but I, I do know what you're saying. Yargle so. is also black. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it probably should have been Saltai just to get more frogs because black is a pretty heavy frog color for some reason. So I think that would have improved it. What do you think of playing this card in the 99 of other like self mill style commanders? Is there any chance that you can play this with Madrotha or something where it's like um, I attack, I mill some cards, I get to exile some permanents and cast them like yeah is that good enough attack and draw two or three cards with this is that is that something you could play in a non-frog deck or is this just a jank frog card uh, <laughs> this is a very janky frog card so i don't know I mean, the, the, the bar mill, for 99 is not that high right if you just want some self milling action like it's not there's so much horrendous. better there's so much better because it's whenever a frog attack. So like assuming this is the only frog in your deck, you mill three cards. You know what I mean? I'm like, ee. Uh, I don't know. There's, all, there's just a lot. You can put croak counters on things. OK, what I'm about yes. standard? Yes. Standard would change links. You play a bunch of change links. You play this, you attack, you like mill 12, get all your permanents. Seth is all about the four mana draw cards. He's expecting a turn five at some point. <laughs> Seth, where? That's you not get... how standard works, Seth. <laughs> <laughs> like Richard's saying, I agree. You get to do all these value things, but just remember. You can draw your all last the cards turn. you want when you're packing up your sideboard and putting it in your deck box. Like, you're going home to a bunch of birds pretty fast if you don't do something on turn four. <laughs> yeah dude like it's because you need to kill this person so oftentimes you could have all the value in the world and it won't matter because you won't see your turn five i think i think i'm living in the the world of standard that i want not the one that exists <laughs> when it comes to these value cards <laughs> oh oh yeah no for sure then and, and then, and then you know value off actually play a mid-range game but otherwise yeah nice try do we have any other standard frogs though like real question uh, there are yes there are there's frog hemoth pretty good frog there's <laughs> yeah. brog befuddler not a very good frog and an unwilling ingredient happens to be a frog plus you have a croaking counterpart that can make copies of things as a one one green frog so there, there's a few there's a few you can build a frog deck in standard that sounds like a good against the odds <laughs> deck actually it's pretty funny i actually That's, like i like these less serious cards that they make I love that it's got the arm hanging out of its mouth too. For the that calls back to like the first frog they ever printed, Chubtro, uh, Chubtro. So I think Wizards done a really good job uh, with the nostalgia <laughs> recently. Are, are you laughing at Chubtro, Toad, Krim? Yeah, because I'm like, oh, what, what is Seth gonna say here? What's Seth gonna say here? <laughs> Not that I but, know what the, those words mean. So it's fine. But I, but I do like the, I do like the callback uh, in the nostalgia that they've been slipping into some of these sets. All right, so we're going super long. So if you want to check out the rest of the previews, there's like so many. There's so many mythics we haven't talked about. They released a lot of them. So check them out at mtgpreviews.com. Uh, and let's get to one fish mail to close out the cast. If you have questions, send them to at mtggoldfish with the hashtag mtgfishmail, and we'll get to your questions on air. Uh, Dr. Mac, we've been worried about Watsy getting rid of paper since Arena's taking off and then digital only cards, but is price the thing that kills paper? I can't imagine playing modern and increasingly standard in paper. Seems like casual commander is it. So there's, there's definitely price concerns, although I will say standards actually gotten a lot cheaper than it was not that long ago. There's plenty of competitive standard decks that are like around $200 and there's some budget friendly ones that are like or closer to $100. So I think that standards actually not in that bad of shape price wise compared to a few years ago when we were talking about $800 standard decks and the most expensive standard of all time. But I do think uh, I have some big concerns about modern and how the price is spiraled so much thanks to Modern Horizons 2 and the expensive cards in those sets. My hope is that wizards can realize that that's a bad thing that uh, that modern horizons and sets like that are great but they got to do something about the supply issue maybe like putting stuff like ragavan at rare instead of mythic or like the staples at lower rarity so i'm hopeful that it's a a problem that wizards can fix but i do think that is a concern uh if prices keep creeping up 
that's more people get priced out of playing paper magic or competitive paper magic and then that's uh, definitely a bad thing then modern heads the way of legacy and vintage where uh, they're great formats but people just simply can't afford to pay four thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars for a legacy or vintage deck so i do think it's a concern but i don't think it really hits on standard if anything i feel like because of collector's boosters and some of the other stuff we've seen standard has actually gotten a lot cheaper uh in the last couple of years yeah, the, the average standard deck right now is like around like maybe 250. Mono green is 250. Is it dragons 335? Mono white 150. Uh, but if you look at like something like modern, we're talking about 900 for hammer time, 1200, 1300, Murktide region, 1200, Azorius control, uh, even burn is 500. So like if you had the choice of just building a commander deck or building a modern deck, like Maybe just build a commander deck and then just play Magic Arena for free. So yeah. I'm actually curious, like we've had COVID for a while. We've had short supply of cards and supply chain issues. So like no one really knows what's going on with tabletop, lack of tournaments as well. So as the next year unfolds, I guess we're going to see what the real impacts are on paper. But like I don't want to own a modern deck anymore. And I certainly don't want to buy a standard deck. Like who knows if Is It Dragons getting banned next week, right? Like nobody <laughs> knows. Right. So it's like a pretty risky proposition to spill three hundred dollars for a gold span dragon deck when you don't know if it's gonna survive. Um so you can just play arena for free. Or you know, a hundred dollars will get you an arena deck. Uh, free. So yeah. Uh, so that's all the time we have for Fish Mill this week. So thank you to everyone who sent in questions. If you have questions, send them to at Goldfish with the hashtag MGFishMail. And we'll get to your questions on air. And I believe that that brings us to the end of episode 353 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. So Richard Cribb, thanks for hanging out. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to Card Conduit for supporting the show. And we will be back next week to talk about more Innistrad Crimson Mouse spoilers and whatever else goes on in the world of magic so until then have a great week everyone and this is a crew signing out